Thanks for coming. Appreciate your spending your Thursday night with us. Um, so we're going to talk about how to put together a manufacturing strategy. Uh, I'm Scott from Dragon Innovation. And um, before I get rolling, um, just a few things. One is I'd love to make it really interactive. So stop me anytime. Uh, it's a lot more fun if we have a dialogue than if I just talk. But I'll start laying down some stuff sort of as food for thought. And um, I always like to do a poll um, before I get rolling just to see who's built stuff out there. So who has built a functional prototype before just by a show of hands? Nice. All right. Cool. And has anybody um, built a product that's actually gotten in the market and other people have bought? Nice. All right. And we'll take it a step further. Has anybody sold over 5,000 units? Can we go for 50,000? Nice. All right. Cool. That helps a lot. All right, so we'll get rolling. And I think, um, so Sean, my uh, colleague and friend from Dragon is here videoing it. Um, we'll find a way that we can post this online. We'll figure out something. OK, so let's start with um, some questions. So I've got five products here. And uh, we'll circle back to these at the end. But so we get rolling. So this is uh, one of the Roombas. Where, where do you think we, uh, where would a good place to build that be? And we'll do a binary answer, although there's many more. We'll say US or China. OK, why would you pick China? OK, a lot of assembly. Yep, a lot of uh, manual, manual labor. OK, any other reasons? OK. All right, uh, how about the goop in a bottle? Anywhere? How many think U.S.? How many think China? Wow, interesting. Okay, some of you picked the U.S. Why would you build it here? It's really high volume stuff. Um, bingo. Yep, highly automated. Right. And it, exactly. Yep. The other thing is, um, and I'm not an expert in chemicals in China, but they tend to drift a lot. There's a great book, which I think it's in Poorly Made in China, where you'll see, um, yeah, the recipe change, and for a product you put on your skin, not always what you're looking for. Um, this is a cool yoga chair from uh, one of the um, students uh, who's now graduated, but at Olin College, so I used to teach, so I always use that. What do you think that would be uh, good to build? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's got a little cut and sew on the, on the seat, um, and then this big, big molded part. And we'll say that's sort of in units of 5,000. OK. And how about uh, jeans or you know, general cut and sell in pretty high volume? OK. Why do you pick uh, as something other than China that's not the US? What, um, so let's say it's definitely your, the group picking not China, but also not the US. What are you, what are you um, looking for or what are you surveying for? Exactly. Yeah, there's no, there's very little skill involved in this compared to putting together a Roomba. So you want to maximize or like, reduce the labor cost as much as you can. And then I used to work at iRobot, so we have a lot of like with Norman uh, and probably a bunch of other folks. Um, we have a Packbot here, which is a military vehicle. So that makes sense to build in the U.S. or China. Well, all right. So a few things um, for China. So kind of what it was known for a while ago is low cost labor. And definitely, as we'll talk about at the end, the labor costs keep going up exponentially. So that's, that's changing. But um, what we see for wages in the factories we work with is usually 4 to $6 an hour, kind of the range is from 2 to 8. And we only, we a, only work in factories that um, we would work on ourselves, and we're going to sleep well at night because they treat the workers incredibly fairly. Uh, and also, what we build is a little bit more complex, so the wages are higher. But compared to, say, a US wage, that's definitely less, less than it would cost to build here. Uh, another thing that we see in China, and let, let me ask, how many of people have been to Shenzhen or the Pearl River Delta? Okay, oh, interesting. Um, so, yeah, it's truly the world's factory. It's just a phenomenal, I want to say the um, Delta is maybe 80, mi 80 miles long, you know, and sort of like a, a V-shape with factories on all sides. And I don't know the exact stats, but I want to say like 80% of the world's um, consumer electronics goods and toys are built there. It is absolutely um, it's just amazing being an engineer to see like this much capability. So, you know, if you compare that to Boston or any other place, 
you know, the density of manufacturing is just really, really fat tight. Um, and there's a tremendous supply chain. So if you needed to find um, 0603 resistors, like chances are you could just walk down the street and there's somebody that can sell them to you. Whereas here, you know, it's a little harder to find that stuff. So that, that's one of the great things about China. And also the supply chain is robust. So if your resistor um, dealer goes out of business, you can really easily find another one for most, uh, most things. Now, over in the US, you know, having kids that aren't quite old enough to code, but when they are old enough, they'll probably be coding away. That's sort of what we do. Whereas in China, there's a whole generation, or at least a generation spent uh, building things. They grew up um, sort of, it, it's in the nature to go and learn how to manufacture and build things. And just the knowledge you can get in China from somebody who has built just a tremendous number of goods across many industries is phenomenal to tap into. So that's a tremendous value add. Um, and again, there's just a huge amount of manufacturing there. Um, the infrastructure is there, so these are a bunch of injection molding machines. Uh, there's great transportation. So the roads, at least where we are in Shenzhen and um, Dongguan and Guangzhou, are often better than the roads in Boston. So if we think of 128, you know, we've been working on that for, I want to say, four years, trying to widen the road and get that ready. In China, there's, every time I would go to one factory, there'd be a new road, so I never would bother learning how to get there, because it would change every time. So it'd be really good business to be in the map making business in China. So it's still take the maps, because we'd always have a, a good audience. But just phenomenal infrastructure and also logistics to get the, the goods out. Some of the challenges with China, at least being based in the US, is it's really far away, um, which creates a whole host of, of um, challenges. So for example, if Bob and I wanted to build a project, it'd be a lot easier if we were to sit down at the same table and be able to close the loop really tightly. Whereas if you take me and send me over to China, and it's still Bob and I speaking in English, we've got a lot of challenges we have to overcome. So it's uh, the distance can be a challenge. And then the language is obviously very, very different. Um, I know a little bit of Cantonese, and I'm a huge fan of it. So it's worth learning the language. It's just an absolutely beautiful thing. But it is really hard if you're trying to talk with somebody, and they're speaking in Chinese, and you're speaking in English. Um, you know, everything we have in engineering, it's all about the bandwidth and being able to iterate quickly and go fast. And it just adds extra complexity if, if you're speaking different languages. Yeah, so that one is changing. Um, it's definitely evolving, but certainly the, um, I have to think of a good example. Like in the US, I find um, just anecdotally, if we're working on a project, so Ben and I are sitting here both thinking about something, the FedEx guy is going to come in and he'll give, he'll give you an opinion about how you should do it. Um, where in China, what I've seen is often people will respond to what you've asked them to do, but they won't question it. They won't say, are you sure you want to do that? or how about doing it a different way? Um, so it's just something to be aware of. Um, you know, and who knows where the right answer is. One's neither better nor worse than the other one, but they're just, they're just different. Um, so that's a little, little very basic um, background in China. Um, so if you want to build something, the criteria that we start going through are, are you sensitive to the cost of goods sold or the, the cost? Um, an example is a, uh, an iPhone, you know, there's a, um, it's in a consumer market, so it's important to get the right price point. Uh, does it require significant manual labor? I think this is a point uh, Bob brought up in the, in the beginning. You know, if you imagine you can get 10 fingers for $4 an hour, that's phenomenal capability. Um, you know, just like if I was, we'll take the other extreme, uh, if I was a robot and wanted to move my beer from here to here, you know, that requires Rod Brooks and the whole um, We Think Robotics guys to be able to pull that stuff off. I mean, it's an insanely awesome and challenging project, but I can do that day in and day out, no matter what the lights are, no matter where the beer is, no matter if it's a light beer or a Guinness or whatever, uh, for $4 an hour. So the, um, just the power that we have in our hands, you can sort of think of it like renting 10 fingers for an hour for 4 bucks. You can do amazing things. When we were building the Roomba, the line was actually about about this big, although they configured a little bit differently. We have 5,000 workers banging away to build 40,000 a week. So you can just do amazing things. Like, you just would not believe how manual it is with um, the way lines are set up over there. Um, sort of an obvious one, but it's worth stating, is we always look for at least 5,000 5, units. And we think of this as an MLQ, or minimum order quantity. The, um, and the reason is there's all this infrastructure to set up if you're building in China. 
from you know the distance and the transportation and finding a factor and all of that versus if we wanted to build a hundred projects a hundred units um, you know Ben and I could sit down in the shop and bang that out and it's just a lot more efficient so when you start thinking about China you want to um, and these are just the rules that we use you want to have at least five thousand units and ideally a lot more uh, your annual quantity that could be an annual what the factory is going to look for is probably fifty thousand or a hundred thousand or more because they only make money on volume. They might charge you a little bit on NRE or non-reoccurring engineering, but where they're really going to make their money is on the, um, the piece price. They add a little bit for everyone. So if you're running 5,000 units and they're making a couple dollars a unit, it's not that interesting. Or it's sort of like the, the baseline interesting for them. And ideally, they're betting that you're going to be another Pebble or iRobot or something like this for most of the factories. If you're building 100 units, then time is not, not at all the right, the right place. Um, this is a lesson we learned the hard way. So this is just, again, just a straightforward, pretty big injection molding machine. When we were building this scuba, and I don't know if anybody's seen this scuba, it's uh, like a Roomba, but it, it mocks. We, um, we designed this really cool um, tank where we had the cleaning fluid would go in, it'd do its mopping thing, and then it would vacuum up the dirty fluid. And we were trying to find a way to contain it, so we came up with a double-sided tank, which required a uh, laser welder. And being engineers, there, yes, lasers, cool, let's do that. So we did that, and it's a beautiful machine. It's totally awesome, um, and it was. I think we paid about a hundred, you know, five hundred thousand bucks for it. And it's like, all right, we've got this. Now what are we going to do? And it was built in New York because we didn't have those in China. So we put the thing on a, I presume a plane because it got there quickly, but maybe it was a boat. This would have taken a long time. Somehow we got it over to China, set it up, and then realized that if this thing went down, the whole line is going down. Like we're not building products, and we we're trying to IPO, so it's kind of important not to have that happen. Like, all right, how can we prevent this from going down? Oh, we need spare parts because it had six, I think we had six laser banks, and those you just don't go you know, like next to the resistor guy. He's not going to have a laser bank. Like, all right, let's get that. So that was another 100,000 bucks just to have those in store. And we run at one voltage over here. They run at a different voltage in China. And with this machine, it was sort of like a colony, like a um, Portuguese man or jellyfish. Everything had its own, um, it was, I think we had eight different components making up the machine. And they rewired seven of the eight at the proper voltage and just got one wrong. So and that's the guy flies over from the US, we do a couple all-nighters, we figure it out, and then we're going. But um, it's a long way of saying if you use what uh, exists at your factory, you're probably going to be a lot happier. Because there's spare parts, there's the main knowledge, there's a way to do it. Whereas in the US, we can push the envelope and do things um, just because we've got that tighter bail. Um, another big one is being uh, tolerant to the supply chain. So again, we go back to China is really far away, uh, and you have to get the goods from there to here. Now, shipping in a container is not that expensive. If I remember correctly, it does vary because of the price of oil. But to move a 40-foot HP container here, I think it's about 5,000, or to California, is about 5,000 bucks. And that would hold about 5,000 Roomba, so about a dollar Roomba to ship it from there to here. So not a huge deal. But the problem is it takes six weeks, and um, you have to figure out what your lead time looks like in your supply chain. So when do you have to have this stuff in the store? And then add the extra six weeks. And then what if they want more green ones and blue ones? How do you deal with that with all this long inventory? So that creates all sorts of uh, complications. And it does add a little bit of cost. Now, there's ways around it by doing late stage customization. So you could have a green face plate and a blue face plate ship the goods to the US. And then when the orders come in, snap on the right color and away you go. Um, but you just have to engineer it. Um, so another great thing about China, and I had mentioned um, this before, is there's all this domain knowledge of uh, people that have been building great products for a long time. So if you look at the cost of building, um, and we think of it from a design to manufacture and assembly standpoint, the stuff that we don't really do that often in the US, you can get for maybe 10,000 bucks what would be the equivalent of $100,000 of work over here. And the best thing is you have the people design it that are going to build it. So if they design it by definition, they have to be able to build it. There's no, you know, no way to point the finger. Um, as a sort of a technique, you never want to take work for free. Um, you always want to pay a little bit something because that shows that you own the IP. And if you ever did want to uh, switch factories and say, I paid for this, it's my stuff. Otherwise, the factory might make it more difficult. So it's, it's better to pay, you know, the 3000 or 5000 bucks. The other thing is if you're paying for it, you can push them to get it done in a hurry, whereas otherwise they're a little bit, it, it might take longer. 
No, this is actually, so imagine you had, you were just building a simple clamshell and had straight walls and no draft surrounds. Um, you could hand that over to the guys in China and they would say, oh, well, you're running ADS with whatever texture. You need a half degree draft on this uh, and so on. And they'd be able to put it on for you. And they can even, um, say for the Roomba, it would do even more complex things, you know, in terms of shutoffs or electrical engineering to lay out the board based on your schematic. Um, they'll put on the test points for you, which are great because they're going to want to test it. So there's just tremendous capability beyond that, the manufacturing side. That the companies that are successful will figure that out and figure out how much they can have the factories help with, and then also figure out where the factory is not going to add value. So we don't um, go down a, a wormhole. The big thing is often the concern about protectable IP comes up. And, you know, I don't look at this as a China problem at all, but it's a general manufacturing challenge that you should always practice good IP hygiene so you don't, you know, inadvertently watch your product come out before it should. And this is a case in point when we built the Roomba back in 2002. Let's say the uh, cooling lead time is eight weeks, so it takes eight weeks to have to steal. We started to see knockoff products in the market after six weeks. So, you know, something, something is a little bit funny. And we work with a great factory, like it didn't leak out of them, but something, something happened somewhere. Um, so just general, and I could talk about it more later if you're interested, but what you want to do with your IP protection is there's three systems. There's electrical, mechanical, and software. Mechanical is trivial to knock off. Anybody can reverse engineer it, laser scan it, model it. It's hard to protect. Um, electrical is a little bit harder, but anybody could x-ray the boards if they really wanted to figure it out. Where you want to protect is in the software. And what we always advise is using a bootloader, so a special part in the memory of the chip, where you can um, basically have an um, encryption so that you'll program that in a secure um, environment like Avnet in Hong Kong, where everybody's scanned in and out, there's no pockets, no cell phones, um, so that you know nobody's going to steal your, your bootloader. Then you can sign those chips to the factory, uh, and then you can just download the, you know, send the encrypted code um, to get the updates as often as you want. So that makes it a lot easier, and most of the connected devices we have, they're nothing without the software, so nobody cares if you, you steal the mechanical stuff, it's, it's less annoying. So you'd want to do that. The other thing is by using a consigned part like the processor, you know, without a processor, the, the product's no good. Uh, you know exactly how many you gave to the factory, so it prevents gray market. So one of the, or, um, the uh, sorry, go shift. One of the problems is you order 1,000 units, and then at night the factory makes another 500 units, and those go out the back door. If you consign the chip, you know you gave them 1,000 chips, so there's going to be that much coming out the front door minus the scrap. Um, so that's just another way to protect your supply chain. Um, that's a brief overview of, of China, and you know it's a pretty deep subject, but just very high level. You know, you've got a product, you're figuring out, you know, where should I manufacture it? Any, any questions so far? Okay. We typically don't, and the challenge is that. For most of the companies we work with are going to build 5,000 to 100,000 units, so it's a rounding error. It's just not a lot of volume. And they're also um, typically very constrained on cash. So if you bring more factors in the mix, there's just more parts to manage. And inevitably, somebody's going to run late, um, and you'll have to deal with that. So we find for the low volume stuff, it's easy to keep it simple. But then as you start to be Apple or something like that, then you probably want to break your system up so nobody knows exactly what the thing is and keep them in the dark and then maybe do final assembly in the US so you have complete control of it. But just the logistics of, say, getting five factories to get the stuff done at the right time, having five different project managers to coordinate the schedule, and those make a change that affects another part, you know, it pretty quickly gets out of control. So for the later stage stuff, it absolutely makes sense no matter where you build. But for the early stuff, we, the thing we always advise is you've got to pick a great factory. And we've had out of our, we work with a little over 100 clients, we had one pick a bad factory, sort of against our advice, and it was a, just a giant nightmare. Um, it's just really difficult struggle to work with that. But the ones with a great factory, like you're going to have good days and bad days, um, but you'll get through the bad days if you've got a factory you trust. Um, they got bad advice from one of their colleagues and, um, yeah, it was a little, yeah, it was, they had maybe a 15% um, lower cost than, than everybody else, and there was a reason. 
And then with the factory, the technique for the less reputable ones is they'll, you know, entice you with a lower cost and then all these things happen and by that stage you've got commitments to your customers, you can't delay, and you're, you're held hostage until you start shipping enough volume and then you can go to a different factory. But it's, um, you really, really want to spend a lot of time taking the factory you like. And the thing, we, we have our RFQ or request for quote package, which for us it takes about eight weeks to pick a factory. So it's not a go overnight, hey, I like this guy. <laughs> you know, who, who bought the best food. Um, but you really want to take time and get to know them. And there's a whole different checklist that to make sure you've got a good one. Um, so, you know, sort of switching gears, when do we think about building in the U.S.? Um, one, as Bob uh, mentioned in the beginning, automation is key. So like for a car, you know, it's very highly automated, very high volume. One of the challenges with automation is that not only do you build your product, but then you have to build all this automation around it. So you typically would only do that for very high volume stuff, uh, just because there's cost quality and schedule, and that's going to blow pretty much all of those kind of debug the robots, whereas a human is very adaptable. So usually that's a much higher volume, and it's also a lot more capital uh, intensive. Um, we talked about the shipping expense. China's a long way away. Um, it's not very nimble. Uh, low volume is, is great. So we just uh, rolled out a crowdfunding platform and are seeing a lot of volume, sort of the one to 5,000 units, which is perfect for the U.S., which is, which is exciting to see. But I think there's going to be a lot more domestic manufacturing to support that. But it gives you, you know, in this case, a jet engine. There's just not that much um, high volume demand for them. But just a really high bandwidth ability to sit down and say, oh, I wanted to do this, but why can't we do it that way type of thing? Um, so low volume is good. Um, if you really have IP, like you're building a pure mechanical thing, you might want to, uh, it's a little easier to protect over here. We talked about the laser welder. Um, and there's, uh, for the US government, there's ITAR, which um, Norman will know a lot more about than I do. Norman used to lead um, a lot of the military side and is responsible for the pack bot coming to life. So there's rules that you can't build military stuff outside of the US. Um, so we'd want to factor that in. Uh, let's see if I can do it by memory. Um, so that's sort of, there's sort of inverse um, things. One case we see a lot of clients come to us with, which is interesting to think about before I talk about this, is they want to run maybe 5,000 units and hope that that will lead to 100,000 units. So the question one would inevitably ask is, do we build 5,000 units here, get it going, and then do we move everything to China? Um, and there's a lot of different ways to think about that, and every answer is different. But sort of the, or every approach, it depends on the project. But what we find is that we use different tooling in the US. We use mud frames, so it's like an insert that you drop into it. Whereas in China, we use mold bases, so it's uh, the whole tool itself. And you can't easily transfer one from the US to China. Um, the other challenge is that you develop all this great domain knowledge with the factory that you're working with. And then if you rip it away and send it over there, you have to start all over again. And you also have to buy another set of tools and so on. So anything you can do to really understand the volume that you're going to build in, you know, is it 20,000 or is it 1,000 up front, and do, get validation on that is incredibly useful to, to putting together a good strategy. Um, just a few concerns about China that we, um, we, we have no control over them, but it's good to be aware of. One back in, I think, 05, was, must be, yeah, 05, the currency which was pegged, so I think 828. Um, it floated um, on a basket of nine currencies and reached the plateau and then it's going again. So the more that curve goes up, the less it, um, advantageous it is to build in China. Um, so, and we just have no idea where it's going to go. And there's a lot of, and I'm no economist, but there's a lot of thought that it's undervalued. So that, that definitely could keep going. Um, ways, wages are going up considerably. These are sort of average wages. We see the factories we work with are typically much higher than this because they're a little further up on the um, value scale. But the curve is going up, so that's going to make uh, your product more expensive. Now, in effect, at least for what we do, the percentage of labor over the overall hard cost is a pretty small percent. So it's not a, a huge deal, and I don't tend to lose a lot of sleep over that. Um, if oil goes up, then it's more expensive to move things around. And then we always worry, you know, hopefully the U.S. and China continue to get along. But if for some reason they, uh, they or we impose um, tariffs, for some reason it's, um, 
expensive to import pebbles or maker bots or add those about in the US or Spiros, like that's going to affect uh, the cost of things. Um, and again, we have no control over it. But, um, and I think the, fa the last one I have here is just uh, talking about SARS or um, bird flu or anything like that. Uh, or tsunamis, so the tsunami disrupted the supply chain significantly from Japan. So components got pushed out six months. So if you're planning on launching a product, you're all ready to go, then your components aren't there. That's just, uh, it's, it's terrible from every way you look at it. Um, likewise, for SARS, which I think was back in 03, um, it was, it was an um, infectious disease that was incredibly contagious. So that can take out a whole factory. And then, you know, all your, it's terrible for the factory. And it's, it's terrible all around. Um, so you have to be careful of that. Um, so that's sort of an overview of, uh, we talked about China, went to the U.S. concerns. And I'll just finish up with a little bit of uh, how do you pick a factory, which again is the most important thing you can do. And then I'd love to do some Q&A. Um, and if you have a project you're thinking about building, you can dive into that and see where, where it would be best to build it. Um, so how to pick a factory. The, one of the best things you can do, and this could be in the U.S. or China, if you use China on this slide, is to talk with somebody else who's manufactured there. It's sort of like when you hire somebody, you want to get references. Same idea. Um, you want to go and chat with people and see what their experience um, was. Usually you want to get at least three and probably no more than five factories on your short list. The reason you get three is you get voting. So say we're looking at cost, and we've got um, two factories that give us a quote. I don't know who's high or low. But if I have three, at least I can figure out, hopefully, who the outlier is. And it's not just about cost, but you have your bill of materials, which have, which have multiple um, different components in there. So you can create uh, you know, three columns of the cost of the components. And one technique is to figure out who the cheapest is, and then use that as a fulcrum to get the other guys to come down. Um, but that's why you want three. And if you do more than five, it's just hard to keep track of that many. And you find that you're spreading your IP around a little bit too much, and you haven't been selected. So. That's about the magic magic number. Um, there's no substitute for looking yourself. So we bring all of our clients that build in China over to China. They get to walk through the factories, meet the factory bosses, um, talk to the workers, and make sure we would never work with a factory that's not ethical. Um, it's just the wrong thing to do. But it's really important that you, as the person building the product, as the entrepreneur, go and look at it and start learning how to do this stuff. Um, so definitely get on a plane or get in your car and take a look. Their other customers are good. And then eventually you want to figure out you know, how long, how much does this thing cost to, to make it. So here it's kind of a fine line of how much information do you expose. Ideally you pick five, three to five factories that you've got good references for, you trust, and so on. Um, you still, information is always on a need to know basis. So you'd never send over your pure native SOLIDWORKS files. Instead you might send over images or IGIS or things like that. Just so you never want to lose control of that stuff. Um, but you do need to send enough uh, information so they can give you a quote that's meaningful. Uh, then you always negotiate. Um, some of negotiation is just based on the fact that there might be a misunderstanding. You know, if you thought I wanted a more precise resistor than I actually needed. And some of it is, um, you know, you've got at least three so you can figure out who the lowest one is and push everybody down. The big levers there are. You know, you've got all this stuff going around in the bill of materials, but if you break it down, you've got factory markup um, is a good one to negotiate. And there's actually three parts of factory markup, special, standard, and consigned goods. So you can negotiate those down. Uh, also, the labor rate is a good one, and then the individual components. Um, and then pick a winner, but you definitely want to leave the other ones on good terms, because who knows, if your business takes off, you might want to dual source it and, uh, and go back. So what you want to do is, Pick, um, and let's see if I'm answering the question you're asking, but suppose you've got a product that you need some BFMA. Um, you've brought it a certain way along, but you need to get it to the finish line. You'd want to select factories that had that capability in-house. And it's sort of obvious that you'd want to do that, but you also know that they're going to charge a little bit more on their margins to cover the cost, because they're not really cover, covering it on the NRE. Whereas if you, um, say like DJ here at Bolt, you know, he's, uh, he can design tool-ready parts. He might pick a factory that's just going to build the print because he's done it so many times. He doesn't want to pay that extra overhead. So that's one of the selection criteria of how much capability do you need. And usually you don't, you might want a little headroom, but you don't want to get a lot more 
capability than um, than you need because you're going to end up paying for it one way or the other. Yeah, and that also goes to you sitting down, meeting with the team. You could bring your part and say, you know, how if I'm struggling with this. You know, how would we do the shut off, or do you think we need this, uh, some action over here, or whatever, and see what they say, um, and how seriously they take it. The way we approach it is that we'll create um, over the course of two weeks a fairly detailed package of a Word document describing the client, the funding, the bios, the product, what's done, what needs to be done, and what we're looking for, a fill-in-the-blanks uh, bill of materials, and then a fill-in-the-blanks schedule. We'll pick the factories, get NDAs in place, send it over, and then wait a week and then have the team go and visit. And the, what you want to test is in the course of that week, did they review it? Have they thought about it critically? Have they put together a presentation saying, oh, I'm concerned about this or that? Or are they just sort of looking at it for the first time? You sort of want to get as much data as you can. And you'll see who will bubble to the top. Like, when you think about the negotiation, the cost is the easiest one because it's just math. Um, but what's more interesting is the people. Like, are they fully engaged in it? Are they excited about what you're doing? Or have they got too many clients and it's just a, a hassle to be in the meeting? And that channel is why it's so important to get over there. To pick up. Um, there's a, we'll post this, we'll figure out how to post this online. Um, I won't go through all of these. But a few things to think about are, uh, and I'm not sure where it is in there, but one, we think about the fish in the pond. So you don't want to be a huge fish in a small pond because you can't grow. And likewise, in most circumstances, you don't want to be a super small fish in a big pond because you're just going to get um, stepped on for any big pond that's happening, that needs um, the machines you're working on. So you want to find that right, um, the right balance. Um, payment terms, I haven't seen net 30 in a long time. Usually, if you're lucky, it's um, a little bit of payment up front and then payment in the product is uh, needs the factory. Um, IP, a great one is if they start showing you other clients' products, saying, you know, I never do this, but just for you, we're going to make a special case, check out what we're building over here. And that's good for them. It's a stupid thing for them to do, but they do it because they want to um, impress you, obviously, with their capability. But if they do that for somebody else, you know, you can bet they're going to be showing your stuff to people that shouldn't see it. And a lot of it is just also common sense. Every factory, like the ones we work in are very seasonal. They have busy times and slow times. And then they also sometimes have big orders or low orders. But it does vary over time. So one factory that might be excited uh, early in the year might be a lot less excited later in the year. So that's why you've got to go over and look, look with your own eyes. And I think that's the end of it. And you guys did such an awesome job. Um, before, we don't need to go over this again. This one is usually with Jeff. Jeff, everybody though, you think you'd build it in China, but you want to, if you look in the shower, they're all built here. Um, so, oh, a couple great books uh, in your copious free time. I'm sure nobody has, but I really enjoyed them. Um, so, this explains the life of a factory worker, and it's just really interesting to see from their point of view, you know, what's it, what's it like. China has the biggest migrant workforce in the world. Uh, you know, a lot of it's concentrated in Shenzhen, although the central government kind of push it, push it out of there. So that's an inside look of what, it, um, what it's like to be a factory worker. Uh, this one talks about the, um, the group in a bottle and how things drift and sort of the challenges of an individual person who went over there and is figuring this out. And then this is sort of the classic. Um, and it probably was set. 16 or 17 years ago. So China just moved insanely fast. Just when I used to live in Hong Kong, I'd go back a month later if I was away and there'd be a new building. You know, I was talking about in China, there's new roads. So a lot of things have happened in the last 16 years, but it's amazing to see what China was like back then. And any, if you haven't been to China, you should absolutely go. It's an amazing, beautiful country. Um, really good people. Um, so, um, questions? question, something we think about in the longer term. I think in the next three to five years, at least, China's got a great, is in a great position for at least consumer electronics, which is the field I'm in. I wouldn't be able to talk about other things. And the reason I think that is, one, they just have an enormous labor force, whereas if you look at building in Vietnam, you know, there's only 70 million people there, so you have fewer people that can apply to it. And I just use, I, my wife lives in Vietnam, so I know a little bit about that. Um, the roads in Vietnam are nowhere near what they are in China, so it's harder to move goods. Um, the supply chain isn't there, so you have to ship the goods from China over to Vietnam and go through all the customs and tariffs and, and that stuff. Um, 
and then the domain knowledge isn't there. So for things like clothes and so on, it's going to find the lowest cost labor anyway. I think Bangalore yes, builds a huge number of that because it's not a skilled, it's not skilled, you just kind of get the lowest price. But for consumer electronics goods, I think China um, has got it for at least three to five years. I see in our business the U.S. coming back slowly, you know, with any exponential kind of flat till it goes. But I know with what we're looking at in crowdfunding, kind of the one to 5,000 unit range is what's keeping me awake at night, because that's not a good fit for China. And it's, there's not a lot of great U.S. manufacturers here. So there's interesting things being done at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The Macro C is thinking about building that out instead of obviously deep water flows to come in. But I would imagine what we're going to see is over the next maybe five to eight years, you know, the U.S. manufacturing starting to take off. And it may be odd, maybe Rod Brooks and you think will get their thing out or it might just be manual labor. But there's going to be a huge need for that. And in fact, what I envision is it would be a uh, um, high mix, low volume. So it will be really versatile cell lines where we can run a thousand units, you know, Monday to Friday and then change it all around and then run another one. And the reason I think that will go too is when you're an entrepreneur building the low volumes, you care a little bit less about cost. You care more about speed and feedback and ability to iterate. And as you get to the higher volumes, you care more about cost. So it kind of really makes more sense. But yeah, I think that's going to be a really exciting area to watch. Great question. I, so I haven't studied that deeply. I, from what we've seen in the client's quotes, the tools in China are about 25% of the tools here. Um, and typically, if they're enough volume, we'll just run them in China and, and ship the parts back here. We haven't, in, in, in the US, we usually use the mud frame, so you drop in the insert as opposed to the whole thing. So it's a little, well, you can export tools from China. They don't always run in all the tools that we have here, so it gets a little bit weird. Our experience is it's easy to spread. If you've got enough volume, run them there. If you don't have enough, like photo labs or anything like that, then you can um, shortly uh, a little bit more expensive parts. Yeah. yeah, we do a little bit. Um, so we always look at it what's best for the entrepreneur. We have a great team in China and a lot of experience there, but we always will start, you know, what is the entrepreneur trying to accomplish and where should, it, where should they manufacture it? We um, do, so our clients are basically Boston, New York, Boulder, a little bit Vegas, and then San Francisco. And in San Francisco, um, we have quite a few clients using Sonic out there. I think they do a good job. We built a little bit around um, in the Massachusetts area. We're still kind of finding our way um, there. And it depends what our clients want to build. So there's a lot of great board houses where you can just get a board and get it assembled. That's sort of a commodity here. Um, but if you have to do assembly of plastic housing or so on, we're, we're still looking for good solutions there. But I think, you know, in the, it's sort of in the coming, like that, there's a huge demand for that. It's, it's um, something we want to help figure out. Yeah. Right, so when we prepare the RFQ, we sort of think of the factories as you would a venture capitalist. They have, they often work with very big clients building high volume, and the better ones that we work with are entrepreneurial. So for example, for the Roomba, um, you know, we were just another start venture-backed startup, not a big deal, and eventually we turned into building 40,000 units a week and spending, you know, $100 million or so a year with them. So the factories see this and know that if they want to get in, um, early, then likely the client is going to be very sticky, and we have a good track record of a robot, a robot maker, bot pebble, so on. So we are in a little bit of a unique position that it's not our first rodeo, and for whatever reason, we're, we tend to be able to find great clients, to have great clients come to us. Um, so that's one. Um, for the RFP package, you want to, and this is where the VC part comes in, you want to make your project as exciting as you possibly can. It's not like as a small entrepreneur, you'll get your pickup factories and they'll all be falling over themselves to help you. But you've got to market it to the factory, which is why in the Word document, for us it's like usually 20 pages. And we'll talk about the management bio, what else have you done, have you raised VC? 
get them excited about the product uh, market size um, and all of this so that it gives them every chance to get excited and see the potential as opposed to just being another injection motor part. Um, you know, do we have as much leverage as Apple? You know, absolutely not. Um, but that's sort of the art form that we find is, you know, picking great factories and, um, yeah, knowing who to talk to and get them excited. But it's definitely a selling. You gotta, you gotta work it. You just can't send it over. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so they, um, we work with them for a long time, and there's some um, background with them due to NDAs I'm, I can't share, but they are building them beautifully. Uh, NDAs relating to building in China, um, not their quality is awesome, but they've been a great example of a, a local firm that's building locally and enjoying all the advantages of that. Um, so I don't know if they'll ever go to China. Like they, they may, um, they may have figured out the recipe. Yeah. So what I would look at is, do I think I can grow it to fifty thousand units or a hundred thousand? And a, you know, anybody's guess, but knowing as much as you know. And if the answer is yes, I go in. I guess if it was yes and I was either willing or had the ability to go to China or had enough money to work with somebody that could help. I, knowing what I know now, I would go to China. If it was 5,000, that's it, I'm never going to get more than that. Then I would develop a relationship with a nearby, within driving range, um, CM so I can sit down and, and iterate. So yeah, sort of low volume, lower budget, um, stay in the U.S. and if it's going to go big, then I think China makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so you can get pretty far. Um, so if we pick, let's say the, it's got a board and some plastic enclosure. So the trick with plastic is that, A, it's probably not going to cost much unless you're using expensive resin. So you could almost just forget it or, you know, assume the electronic components are going to drive it. But if you did want to figure out the cost, the cost of the plastic is driven by the cost of the resin in dollars per kilogram. And, um, you know, roughly, as a crude order, we do it a little more precisely, but you could say I have 10 grams of ABS and it costs us a dollar a kilogram. Um, so you figure out what that is. And then the second part of it is what size mold are you going to run it on? How much does it cost hourly to run the mold? And how, what's the cycle time to get it out? So you could say, all right, the mold operator is going to cost me $5 an hour, which is not a bad place to start. And my cycle time is a minute. Um, and do the math and then add those two together and then assume the factory's markup is 15%, which covers overhead stuff and uh, profit. So um, get the cost of the plastic and then multiply by 1.15, and that's the cost of the piece. And then for your electrical components, and we have at Dragon just metrics for what a square inch of a two layer, four layer board costs, um, as long as it's nothing too insane. So we can um, price that out pretty quickly. And then components, we just have huge databases. So but you can figure, like, resistors are free, you get 10 for a penny. Um, so just ignore those. And it's truly, like, it's a Pareto that 80% of the bomb is driven by 20% of the components. So just figure out what those are as a rough order of magnitude. The things you want to, that most people forget are labor, which is always not a huge amount, but it is something. So based on what I said, assume $5 an hour and sort of estimate how long it would take, you would take you to put together. And that will give you a number. Um, you'll need packaging, so often uh, if you retail at a gift box, it's just sort of a kind of four color box. And then you can't put all the, or you don't want to put all those in a container because they'll just fall down and make a mess. So you have a master carton, which is sort of the big ugly cardboard, cardboard box, and your master carton wants to be this big. So figure out how many um, gift boxes go in the master carton, and then divide the master carton cost. And let's say it's a dollar to pick a number, by that, that gives you that number. And then add all that up, and then assume the factory's markup is 15 to 20 percent, so then add it up from there. Um, uh, you'd want to be a little more rigorous, but that's sort of the way I would approach it. <laughs> Done. Ship it. <laughs> yeah, I think there is a lot of value to that for the lower volume stuff because you can do different things with injection molding than you can do with CNC. 
like for CNC, it's a pain in the ass to put draft on it. But if you've got a deep draw, you know, the draft is going to start to add up over time. Um, so I think, yeah, and just the way you, if you drop it, if you want to do a drop test, it's better to use the actual molded part because you get better response. You can do different resins that you might not be able to do. So like if you want to do something over molded and say it was important, like you're building a toothbrush, um, you can't see and see that. So yeah, I'm a big fan of using molded parts when you can. Yeah, I mean for CNC parts, first cut is incredible. Or if you wanted, um, sometimes you could either 3D print or use first cut to create something and then use that to create a, uh, another, like a soft tool, like a um, silicon mold. Yeah, they're phenomenal. Yeah, then in proto mold, you don't get to keep the tool. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, you'd have to figure out, I was talking with Chris Anderson, um, who was really, he really wanted his tool, and I can see that, you know, it's less like that. So, yeah, it depends if you want your tool or not. Cool. All right, well, uh, yeah. And yeah, we Please. haven't even gotten into quality yet, so that's a whole other thing, but we always think of the triangle as cost, quality, and schedule, and each one of them is a long, long and interesting topic. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you for coming out tonight and spending your Thursday evening with us. And, uh, any questions, let us know. Yeah.